thank you for coming today. Um, I hope you're looking forward to meeting everybody and lots of interesting work. Uh, my name is Katie Parlow. I'm the Director of Regions and Community Action at Sustainability Victoria. And to kick off proceedings today, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're all joining the meeting from today. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and also do the same for the elders, past, present and emerging of the lands from which you're joining today's meeting. Sustainability Victoria would really like to acknowledge that we live and work on the lands of the world's oldest and most sustainable culture and acknowledge the deep connection to earth that First Nations people have and the invaluable contributions they've made to our understanding of climate change and the environment. Before we um, jump into the detail of what you've all come to today, um, what I would like to do is just give a brief overview of Sustainability Victoria, who we are. Sustainability Victoria, many of you would be familiar with, um, but it's exciting um, that in the last few months, we've just launched our new three-year strategic plan. And we've got a very strong focus over the next three years in helping Victorians transition to a circular, climate resilient and clean economy. economy. And the reason for that is that we're very keen to not only make sure that materials are used at their highest value circulating for the, through the system as long as possible, uh, that the way we use materials also makes a really big difference to the emissions we generate. Nearly 50% of the emissions we produce come from the way we use and create things from the materials um, that we bring out of the environment. So a very critical thing will be to accelerate the process by which we're making sure we're using those materials as well as possible for as long as possible. And we've got three focus areas. Uh, one of the key things will help be to help um, work with communities and people like yourselves to ensure there's a stronger understanding of what a circular economy is and how you can be involved in it. Secondly, it's moving us from thinking about the great work we've done on recycling to now think about how we can de design and manufacture to keep things circulating at that high value. And very importantly, the third stream is how can we make it easy for everyone to take part? And I guess that's a really nice theme to kick off today's workshop. Uh, one of the roles that we'll be playing is to keep working with individuals, organisations and community groups to make sure that we're helping build the connections helping people come up with the ideas, see where the opportunities are, understand what networks might be around to support um, all of you, help your communities to move forward in creating that climate resilient, thriving community that we're looking for. So I'm very excited to hear about the ideas that are generated today. I hope you are too. Um, I'll look forward to checking back in and hearing about some of the ideas that have come forward. Have a great day and I'll see you towards the end of the session. Thank you. So we're here with th at the invitation of Sustainability Victoria with three things we want to take you on a journey around. Um, and they are to inspire and inform you. So that's the pressure on us. Um, so that about how communities are already taking a lead, owning and accelerating sustainability transitions. So we're going to be... Um, we're going to be using lots of stories and examples along the way uh, and you'll notice that there are people in your groups who are already part of this I think and so you'll get to get a sense of what else is out there across Victoria too. We want to also see the potential for action and nearer the end and possibly afterwards environment, uh, Sustainability Victoria are going to be interested in whether or not um, you'd like to see a network evolving out of this. Yeah, thank you so much, Kate, and hello, everyone. I, too, would like to start by paying my respects to uh, First Nations people, particularly across Victoria, where many of you are joining from, um, but myself, I'm joining from the lands of the Gumbangia people, uh, so paying respects to those. And I'm going to share a, a presentation with you, so let me get that started. Yeah, as Kate said, um, I'm Megan Burkett, part of the Ethical Fields team. Um, and yeah, I'm really driven um, by just a fierce passion for regeneration, um, equity and collective prosperity. Um, so it's really great to be here with you today 
Um, and by the nature of the topic, um, I'm assuming um, that that's the same for many of you that are here. So in this section, I'm going to introduce and set the scene for our workshop today. So there are four key messages. I'll just get those up for you. There are four key messages that we're going to go through this sort of setting the scene session. So I'm going to start with an overview of how communities can take the lead in their sustainability transitions, what we're all here for. I'll then provide an overview of how they are doing this. Um, we'll then explain the benefits and the importance of approaching sustainability, trans sustainability transitions in this way. Uh, and finally, I'll explain how we'll explore these concepts in the remainder of the workshop. So it's just an introduction to start now and we'll go deeper as we move through the workshop. Um, so today we aim to uh, inspire and inform you about this concept of how communities are leading, how they're owning and how they're accelerating their sustainability, sustainability transitions. And we're going to explore how these approaches can help communities to better succeed with your sustainability aspirations um, and how they can help to align local economies with local sustainability, social and economic goals. Now, by communities, um, we mean local people and local organisations broadly. Um, so we mean families, we're talking about community groups or community organisations. Um, we're thinking of local business and local government and non-government organisations, school groups. Um, so I imagine that would include all of you here today. Um, so we're talking about you and we're talking about the communities that we come from and other communities across Victoria and Australia. Now, communities broadly hold visions for a more sustainable society. Um, we hear from many communities that they desire renewable energy, they desire sustainable consumption, circular economies, nature restoration, and a whole range of sustainable aspirations. And in pursuit of these aspirations, um, we know that individuals and communities are taking a range of actions um, that are within their control and influence, their current understanding of what their control and influence might be. Um, so, you know, this might be things like uh, managing sustainable households, uh, buying sustainable products, uh, you know, communities are campaigning to politicians. Um, we know there's a lot of activity to set up um, and volunteer with sustainability initiatives uh, like a local repair cafe or a community garden. And these are all really important actions, um, really important actions that we should continue uh, to take. Uh, but many of these activities rely on volunteer efforts. Um, they rely on temporary and very ad hoc grant funding. And because of this, it really limits their long-term impact um, and their sustainability and scalability. And we hear from many communities that they want to, or I'll just change my slide for you, we hear from many communities that they want to um, break free from that grant cycle um, and find sustainable funding sources. We hear that they want uh, greater control and influence over their economic and societal direction. Uh, they recognise that they need a more significant shift in the way our economy operates if they are to achieve their sustainability aspirations. However, the current economic system um, for many of us and many communities often feels beyond our control. It feels to be dominated by external corporations and interests. And many of us know that this system really extracts wealth from communities, it limits local ownership and control, and it really concentrates power in the hands of a small few, many of which do not reside in your community. And as a result, um, we know that communities feel disempowered and they feel at the whim of the industrial and economic machine, you know, pursuing growth and profits. 
Um, and, and I know that, you know, many of you might be feeling that way yourselves. Um, but we're here today to uh, say that new possibilities have been unlocked. And today we're going to learn how communities can expand their control and influence over their local economy, how they can expand their control and influence over essential services, over industries, over business and assets and financial flows. And we'll explore how communities can become board members, shareholders, how you can become investors, developers, and you can step into these roles traditionally dominated by corporations. So we're gonna discuss how community organizations can redefine the value of their sustainability initiatives, establish commercial and community owned enterprises and access more aligned financing that you need. And by doing this, uh, you know, communities can then redirect and they can leverage these activities to achieve their sustainability aspirations, but also enhance um, socioeconomic well-being at the same time. So how are communities doing this? That sounds great. That sounds excellent. That's what we need. How are communities doing this? So um, those that are um, seeing success in this space are using more community-centered and regenerative economic approaches. <clears throat> so these are um, approaches such as um, community wealth building, place-based capital, community economic development, donut economics, and well-being economics. And some of you may have heard of some of those terms, but some of those may be um, new to you. And you don't need to have an in-depth understanding of any one of those individual models, um, because today we're gonna sort of step you through some of the commonalities of those models and some of the key enabling elements of those models. Um, so while each of these models differs in its specifics um, of what it's trying to do and how it works, um, what we know about all of these models is that they share common guiding principles that shape how communities approach local economic and sustainability initiatives. So let's start by looking at these principles now. So these are our guiding principles that shape how communities approach local economic and sustainability initiatives. So we have a place-based. Communities are connecting economic activities to the ecological and bioregional limits of the place, ensuring that they are informed and defined by the local environmental conditions. We have people and sort of living being centric. Um, so communities are empowering the people and the other living beings that value and rely on the local economy and the environment the most. So local individuals, families, business, employees, community organizations, local ecosystems and wildlife. They are being prioritized and empowered. Locally led and controlled. Communities are promoting local planning, decision-making, governance, so that these empowered local people can directly participate in the activities and decisions that are affecting their lives um, and thereby democratizing their local economy and development. The next one is local ownership. So communities are enabling more local people to hold a financial and controlling share and stake in local businesses, in investments and assets. And they're ensuring that those ownership rights over those things are remaining in their community and benefiting their community. The next one is inclusive and equitable. So communities are ensuring that all local people, regardless of their background, can participate in and benefit from local economic activities with equitable access to resources and opportunities. We then have circularity. So communities are creating these local economies that are reinvesting back into the community 
They're keeping the wealth and the resources and the opportunities circulating locally to multiply the impact that they have in their community. Redefining value. So communities are centering social and ecological well-being in value creation. And finally, we have a systems approach. So this is holding that all together. We've got communities considering how their actions contribute to the larger economic and sustainability system. So we now have this more regenerative and community-centered guiding principles that we know communities are using and getting a good effect from. But where the rubber really meets the road is when communities actively implement and adopt these guiding principles in key economic areas. So in today's workshop, we're going to explore five key economic areas um, that communities and you can leverage to lead, uh, to own, and to accelerate your sustainability transition goals. So the first one is the community role in the economy. So individuals and communities can expand their roles in the economy to gain more control and influence over sustainability transitions, but also to steer those local economic activities and development um, in alignment with their or your values and needs. The next one is services. So communities can obtain more control and influence over the production of goods and the delivery of essential services and change the purpose and nature of these services. The next is businesses and enterprises. So communities can establish and operate commercial businesses and enterprises that support community-led and own sustainability goals. We then have assets and resources. So communities can gain more control over local assets and resources, ensuring that they're used in ways that su support sustainable and community values. And finally, finance. So communities can access aligned sources of finance and take control of financial flows to support their sustainability transitions. Now, you have all of these individually, but when communities um, leverage a combination of these areas, they can really achieve even more impactful outcomes in their communities. So throughout the workshop today, we're gonna delve into um, these areas and provide an opportunity to apply this to your context. All right, so the next sort of key ingredient in how communities are taking control of sustainability transitions are some really important drivers and enablers that are making this possible. So historically, the success of economies, um, of industries and development has relied on factors such as fossil fuels, undervaluing natural resources, um, centralised mass and linear production, uh, global supply chains, overconsumption and growth. And this is a story we all know too well. Um, we then have, of course, this ownership of large industries being concentrated in the hands of few and often outside of place. And until recently, it actually has been difficult to compete with and disrupt that formula for industrial activity. Um, but excitingly, there are, um, there are a whole range of drivers and enablers that are now facilitating community-led sustainability transitions and regenerative economies. So I'll just touch on a few of those today that are really most important. So um, they include small-scale energy production and battery storage becoming more accessible. Um, of course, an increasing demand for circular economies that operate within ecological limits. Um, we now have the potential for more decentralised and small-scale manufacturing technologies, allowing, um, allowing more localised um, activities. We've got degrowth movements advocating for that reduced consumption. Um, we've got digital transformations that enabling more sort of precision production without the need for that mass scale. Um, and we have new value measurement that, sort of, that prioritises sustainability um, and social outcomes. So these shifts are um, these shifts are also critical in making um, sustainability um, community-led sustainability transitions viable. 
And it's important to recognise that um, some sustainability transitions may not yet be possible by community because of the technological or other factors. So we do need to have the right combination of factors, um, but when the conditions are right, the possibilities are really great. So why is this so important? Um, you know, why is community-led uh, transition so important? And I would say that there is already an industrial and ecological transition underway. And that is opening up new pathways for us. So as individuals and communities, we have a few choices. I've put three options down here. There's possibly more, but I think these are three of the most likely options of where these industrial and ecological transitions might take us. The first option is that we allow corporations and politicians to continue to lead, um, which risks failure to meet sustainability goals due to insufficient action. We've seen this for a long time now. Option two is to allow corporations and wealthy individuals to lead. Now, they might potentially achieve those sustainability goals technically, but that will happen in a way that keeps that power and wealth concentrated, um, leaving our communities behind even more. Or we've got option three, where communities take the lead, communities achieve the sustainable transi transitions they want, and they reclaim that control and power over their economies. Um, so I know from my perspective, the third option is a win-win-win for communities. So last, um, summarising this up for you, is so um, communities um, and likely many of you are already in a good position to approach sustainability transitions in this way. And over the remainder of this workshop, we're going to help you to develop a richer understanding of how this is occurring. We're going to do this in a few different ways. So in this introduction I've just provided, I've given a bit of a framework that you can apply using the guiding principles and the key economic areas. Next, we're going to share three sustainability transition stories that showcase how communities are doing this. And then finally, we're going to explore those economic intervention areas and strategies in more detail. Alrighty. So, having introduced that, we're now going to bring this to life a little bit more. We're going to apply this to three critical sustainability transition areas. So you can see how this looks a bit more practically. You can see what this looks like um, if it's applied in a community. And we're going to look at renewable energy, circular economies and bush regeneration and protection. So hopefully between those three sustainability themes, there's something in there for everyone. So everyone that's joined today can resonate with one of those sustainability themes. Um, and so you can get a picture of that. So I'm going to start with energy transitions. And the reason I'm starting with energy transitions is I think most of you will be able to easily relate to this story and how these concepts of regenerative economic approaches and community-led transitions um, work. So in the past, the energy industry was dominated by fossil fuels. It required centralised and large-scale production. And the scale of infrastru infrastructure required meant that only those with significant wealth and capital could participate um, in the industry, such as large corporations and governments, because you needed a lot of money to set up the infrastructure and the technology um, to, to sort of operate in the energy industry. So as energy was further privatised over the last century, communities became um, mere consumers, consumers of energy, um, despite being the most major energy users um, other than big industries across Australia. So this centralised control, and it meant that the decisions about energy, such as pricing, 
and how to transition energy were um, out of local hands. And um, it then continued to pe perpetuate this reliance on fossil fuels. Now, however, communities are leading the shift to renewable energy. So renewable and small scale energy production using battery storage and distributed grid technology is allowing communities to generate and control their own energy. And it's reducing reliance on that mass scale production. So communities can invest in, they can control, and they can govern their energy systems through community energy schemes. And they can reinvest the benefits and the profits from those schemes back into their community locally. So let's look at three examples of this in practice. And here is where I'm applying those principles at the start that can feel a bit amorphous. I'm applying those economic areas um, and I'm bringing it to these real life situations. So the first example is um, with households and families. Households and families are installing solar panels and batteries. They're owning that energy asset on their roof. They are producing their own energy and they're feeding the excess of that into the grid for payment. So in that one simple um, example of households and solar on a roof, you can see the principles starting to come together. The next example is a community scale example um, of a renewable energy transition led in this way. And this one is the Manila Community Renewable Energy um, Company. So this started from a group of locals in Manila, a small town who formed a community owned renewable energy company. And they did this so that local residents could benefit from the economic, the environmental and the community building aspects of the project. Um, but they also wanted to create a model of sustainable regional development for their community. So in this um, example, the company and the renewable energy infrastructure was built by funds from local investors and is owned by the community. So the company produces and sells solar and bioenergy and the profits then benefit the community. The company is steered by a local committee and local shareholders, um, which is helping to ensure that local control. Um, and they um, personally, this is them, this is what they promote as the benefits. So they say um, that this initiative, um, you've got local community becoming the power retailer. You've got local investors getting a better than bank interest rate of return on their investment. Local power users get cheaper electricity at a fixed rate. Um, you've got sustainable development, so you've got a community changing to clean and renewable electricity. You've got electricity becoming a local business instead of an economic leakage. And we see that so much at the moment with the price of electricity. It's an economic leakage for local communities. But in this community, it becomes a local business opportunity. And of course, we have community building because everyone is participating in this initiative. All righty. So um, another example that shows the potential for communities to leverage the energy transition is Charge My Street UK. So Charge My Street UK is a community benefit society that installs and operates public electric vehicle charge points. So the company is a community member owned and controlled um, company and it raises money through community shares. Um, now, this one is a bit of an extension, of course, of energy, and it extends to um, our fuel industry and the fuel sector. But of course, how electric vehicles um, and using renewable energies can help us to transition our transport um, and, and also transition our fuel sector. So Charge My Street has already successfully demonstrated that community investment can provide charge points and stimulate demand for EVs um, in areas where there isn't off-street parking and people can't just plug into their home. Um, and so that's that example there. And so I guess what I'd like to say is that whilst community solar is now quite commonplace, um, and, and some of you might be like, 
Yeah, that's yesterday's news. We know community solar. Um, I, I guess I'd just like to say the significance and the potential of this transition with energy and with community controlled and owned energy really must not be overlooked or lost on us. Um, we really must continue to establish and scale household and community owned renewable energy projects um, so that we can ensure community control, um, we can accelerate this transition and we can foster a community owned energy industry where the wealth and the benefits continue to be reinvested back into the community that the energy system is serving. Now let's look at circular economies and the transition happening there. So historically, um, mining, production, manufacturing of materials and goods has been linear. It's been designed for single use and obsolescence. And of course, it's leading to massive waste. Um, the economies of scale and mass centralized production, again, meant that large corporations really have dominated um, you know, production and manufacturing of goods. Um, and the wealth and the benefits from this ultimately have flowed to executives and to shareholders and many of them outside of Australia. And because of this control as well, the decisions about the use of materials, the design of products, the potential for repair and reuse were controlled by these corporations who continue to prioritise profit um, over community and environmental well-being. Um, now, because of that mass production, because of those economies of scale and then cheaper production off offshore, we know um, that many small locally owned businesses um, really just could not compete um, with the production and the distribution of, um, of goods and materials. Okay, however, with growing demand for circular economies, um, with new technologies and with that local and small scale production that I mentioned in that introduction becoming viable, communities can now set up, they can invest in um, things like mining, they can set up and invest in processing and production and manufacturing in reuse and repair initiatives. And in doing so, they can direct those goods and those products towards more sustainable directions. Um, but also importantly, beyond the circularity of materials um, that is usually the focus of circular economies, communities can use their circular economy transitions again to ensure that ownership, to ensure that control and wealth and the benefits from our economy are retained and reinvested into your local community and into your local people. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples um, in our circular economy transition space. So this first one is um, world's biggest garage sale, um, which is now called Sir Economy. Um, so this example shows the power of redefining the value of waste and what community can achieve when they do that. Um, so this initiative started in Morningside in Queensland with a bunch of volunteers who wanted to host a garage sale to repurpose goods, but also to um, raise money to support charities. Um, so this was driven by a community recognition of this urgent need to reduce the amount of household waste, um, but they also wanted to support some local charities. So um, they did that and had great success from those efforts. And, and um, over time, that organisation has now evolved into a for-profit and purpose social enterprise and has achieved results far beyond what we could have ever imagined. So to date, the world's biggest garage sale has diverted over 4 million kilograms of goods from landfill. It's raised over $300,000 and it's saved billions of litres of water from the production of new goods. Um, and it's now actually transitioned into Sir Economy, which is a social enterprise that's going to work on even larger scale circular economy projects. Now, the power of this example is that this model is profitable and it's replicable, which means that they can really accelerate the efforts that they're working towards. The next example is the Lockyer Fruit and Veggie Cooperative. So 
This initiative is working to secure Australia's sustainable food chain and really value sustainable community development. So they want to support local farmers and producers to meet the growing demand for Australian locally sourced sustainable food options. And they also want to transform the Australian food processing industry. So to do this, they're constructing a new um, fruit and vegetable processing facility in Withcock, Queensland. And they've set up a commercial company and a cooperative. And so in this scenario, the members will be asked to take out a minimum um, membership and they'll be able to vote um, on the cooperative and where the direction of this enterprise goes. Okay, so just quickly, our last sustainability transition is um, the story of um, bush regeneration. So this one's a little different. So our historical approach to the natural environment has been one of extraction and pollution, resulting in environmental degradation, undervaluation of nature's role, and again, large corporations profiting from environmental exploitation. Um, now, many communities and landholders have long tried to protect and revegetate and enhance their natural environment. Um, but these efforts were largely considered stewardship or they were reliant on volunteering and limited grant funding. Um, and so unfortunately, this has led to many landholders and community to find it more economical to clear their land rather to invest in it. Um, whereas today, um, there is more of a growing understanding of the importance of healthy and well-functioning ecosystems. Um, so we've got economic approaches like natural capital that are helping local communities and landholders to properly value natural assets, um, environmental market mechanisms providing funding, um, and we've got the land being held by community and people um, providing this growing opportunity for those benefits to be retained in the community. So last example of this one is the example of Helen and Owen, um, Owen Huggins. Um, so they run Savanac Station, which has a really long pastoral history, but it also holds these beautiful large white cypress pines and these other old trees. And these trees provide habitat for about 80 species of birds, including vulnerable species um, such as the wood swallow. Um, so in 2018, they signed a conservation agreement with the Biodiversity Conservation Trust to protect 355 hectares on their property. Um, so the agreement with the trust requires that the land be preserved. Um, and in return, the Huggins receive an annual um, payment from um, that conservation agreement. And um, Helen has reported that um, after thinking deeply about how a conservation agreement and lower stock numbers may impact um, some of the land, um, they agreed that the benefits outweighed any reservations overall. We're now going to take a deeper look at the different economic intervention areas that I um, talked through in our introduction. Yeah. So you remember we have a uh, community role, we have services, um, sure. business and enterprise, assets and finance. Yeah, sure um, and in this section now, so we're now going to take a deeper look um, at those and we're going to start with the role of community in the economy. So the purpose of this session is to inspire and inform you about the diversity of roles, communities, and yourself can play in your economy and in sustainability transitions and how this can open up new and better possibilities for you. So let's start by exploring some of the more familiar roles that communities um, play in our economy and communities play in sustainability transitions. Um, so the first one is households and families. So um, households and families or yourselves might be working to manage a more sustainable household um, and make more sustainable household choices um, for the way your um, house is run and um, the way, you know, you, you choose to live life as an individual or as a family or in a share house or however you live. 
The next one is employees. So um, as an employee, you might be choosing to work in a more sustainability role, um, or you may be trying to encourage your employer to adopt more sustainable practices. The next role that we play is the role of consumer. Um, so, you know, when we're out and about and we're buying goods and we're buying services, we're all out there playing the role of consumer. And um, each time you are making a choice about what you buy, what services you use and where you spend your money, you may be trying to make more sustainable choices about the goods and services that you're engaging with. We also have um, volunteers. So many communities, and we know this because we meet with so many of you, and I'm sure this is many of you in the room, um, may be volunteering with a local sustainability initiative um, or volunteering with a local organisation, trying to help with sustainability in that way. Many communities also often play the role of campaigner and individuals play the role of campaigner. Um, so you might be part of a sustainability campaign, um, you might be protesting or advocating to politicians or businesses um, to shift their sustainability policies um, or activities. And finally, the other um, key role that we all hold here in Australia is the role of voter. Um, so in the way you're voting, you might be voting for parties that align with your sustainability goals. Um, and I'll have a bet that most of you um, are playing one or many of these roles um, or, um, you know, quite a few in uh, your economy, but also in your sustainability actions. And I do, I do really want to stress that these are all really important roles in our communities and we need to continue playing these roles. Um, for our own well-being, but also to achieve the sustainability transitions that we want. But it's really important to acknowledge and to recognise that there is a limit to the level of control and influence these roles can have over our economy. There is a limit to the level of control and influence these roles can have over sustainability transitions. Um, so if you've been feeling dismayed, um, and yet you're doing all this work, um, I, you know, I really pat yourself on the back because you've been doing a lot, but ultimately there's a limit to what these roles can do. And we need to acknowledge that um, and we need to address it. When we apply community-led and regenerative economic principles to the roles that we play, we can unlock more possibilities and we can significantly expand the level of control and influence that communities and individuals can have. And here are some of those expanded roles. Look at that. Your level of control and influence has just multiplied. So let's kind of talk through what some of these roles are and, and I'll try and sort of contextualise it from the perspective of you as an individual um, and how you might be off to step into this role. Um, so we've got the role of a producer. Um, so you could become a producer of sustainable goods and services um, and you could do that by being part of a community-owned production enterprise you know, that's producing food or um, other essential goods and products. The next role that communities can play, individuals can play, is that of an essential service provider. So you can provide essential services like energy production through household solar or community-owned solar. So we spoke through that when we did that energy transition example, but you can apply this to all industry types in your community and across Australia. Communities can step into this role of essential service provider that for a long time have been dominated by corporations and other. Communities can start to play that role. And in doing so, they can really shift the way those services are operated um, and, and what they're used for and how um, they're controlled. The next one is investor. 
So for those of you that have um, some spare money, that can even be $25, $5. Um, you can invest some of those savings into sustainability projects, into sustainability um, businesses, um, or you know you could think about how to um, manage your superannuation funds so that you are directly reinvesting into sustainability projects. Um, for those that only have a little bit of money, you can pull that money together through things like crowdfunding so that you can have a much greater amount of money to invest in sustainability projects in your community. The next one is shareholders. So of course, if you are an investor and that um, comes with shareholder rights, um, you then get to hold shares in sustainability businesses. Um, so you can actually help by um, being part of and leading a business by being a shareholder. Um, alternatively, you could become a shareholder in a more traditional business, not a sustainability business. Um, and you could use your shareholder vote to steer that company in new directions when you get an opportunity to make a decision um, as a shareholder. Um, the next one is, of course, if you're a small business owner or if you're not, um, you could become a small business owner. Um, and then, of course, you can embed sustainable operations and direct that business um, in a sustainable way. We've, of course, got wonderful cooperatives um, and you can become a member of a cooperative. So you could join an existing cooperative or you could help to set one up. Um, and then, of course, that co-op can work towards those shared sustainability goals. Another role is being an entrepreneur. Um, you know, an entrepreneur isn't limited to this sort of like small cohort of individuals over here that call themselves entrepreneurs. Community are entrepreneurs. Communities can create new commercial enterprises that are focused on sustainability goals. Um, we've then got the role of planner. So we often think of a planner being, you know, a, um, you know, someone that works at council and holds a specific role in planning and they are absolutely planners and many of them do a really essential and critical role. But community can more firmly and intentionally step into the role of a community planner. Community can come together and start doing local planning for new circular economy vi villages or sustainable community developments. Um, so you can step into that role of planner and start to direct where your community is going. Another one is the role of developer. So we often think about developers over here and they're doing things we don't want them to and we need to object to that development. And I know that's the role I've had to play for many years. Um, but communities can firmly step into the role of developer in their community. So you can set up um, or you can join a community development corporation that's been set up to drive local sustainable development or address a whole range of social issues. In my community, there's a community development corporation that's um, trying to address affordable housing for women over 50. Um, so they're fully stepping into the role of developer um, and they're doing that, um, doing that through um, a special enterprise. Um, the next one is an asset owner. So you could purchase local land, you could purchase property, you could purchase other assets that are essential and needed um, so that you can use them for sustainable purposes. Now, if you don't have enough money to make that purchase by yourself, you can come together with a group of others to kind of pool your money so you can collectively purchase. Now, many of these roles, once you take on these roles I've just mentioned, that puts you actually in the role of decision maker. So if you're an asset owner, if you're a shareholder, if you're a co-op member, that makes you a formal and official decision maker um, in those enterprises. Um, so you then can step into that role. But you could also decide to join the board um, of a new startup sustainability initiative that's trying to grow um, and needs a board member, or you could apply to join the boards of existing more traditional companies and try to influence the way those companies go. Um, how am I doing for time? Could one of my colleagues just let me know how I'm going for time? You're a bit over. Okay, cool. All right, so I might wrap it up there. Um, so there's a whole range of other roles. We've got regulators, bankers, advisors. You could play the role of broker. 
where you in your community help to facilitate connections and partnerships um, between sustainable businesses or investors and others. Um, and I'll just end by saying, you know, by recognise and recognising and embracing these more diverse roles, communities can really exert a much greater control and influence over their local economic and their local sustainability transitions. So I'm about to introduce um, Samantha, who's also from the ethical team, ethical fields team really passionate in her own community, a recent award uh, winner for some local environmental efforts um, and has um, some hard finance and economics in her background too at the Productivity Commission and uh, one of the state government's treasury departments. And she's taking us through the piece around services, businesses and enterprises in case you couldn't guess by what's on here, but we're also going to later look at finance and other resources and how they might flow better to serve communities. And this is these are things that are very, very close to our heart at the moment. Over to you, Sam. You missed a very important part of my bio, which is that I'm also the local repair Sam, cafe you're coordinator. On mute. Oh, and uh, yes, and the local repair cafe coordinator. So very important part of my role in life and community. Um, <clears throat> so Megan really set the scene this morning around uh, the powerful sustainability and economic transition shifts that we're seeing in these beautiful stories that she shared and really how the role of community um, is and can shift. So in this afternoon session, we're going to start leaning into some of those economic intervention areas, those, you know, the people were pushing those economic intervention areas in that diagram that Megan showed earlier, and explore really how they can help to amplify and advance your sustainability initiative. So I guess being environmentally minded people, um, we're all probably aware that the economy, um, it has been, or our economic system has been a really significant contributor to sustainability challenges. So it often really feels difficult to see the opportunities that can also arise from the economy. Um, so in this first section, I'm going to focus on um, how communities can leverage uh, service, business and enterprise models. And then later on, we're going to start looking at um, finance. Hang in there if that doesn't feel pleasant for, <laughs> for anyone, because um, hopefully it'll be of use to you. So, um, the new versus the traditional paradigm. So, of course, we all know that essential services and businesses have been increasingly dominated by corporations, um, even those that, you know, used to be government owned. Uh, they're owned and controlled by non-local people. Uh, they're really driven by profit. They're disconnected from place and community. Um, this has really limited the ability of community to influence sustainability goals. Uh, in the way that these services, industries and businesses are um, operating. Um, but as we've been exploring this morning, communities can really play a key role in providing uh, essential services. They can play a key role in major industries and sectors. They can set up businesses. They can set up enterprises. And um, as we're learning more community owned models, you know, enable communities to direct services and businesses and enterprises in the direction that we want them to go towards, which um, in our discussions today is towards a sustainable transition. Um, traditionally, you know, communities wanting to support transitions are undertaking, you know, uh, bush regeneration work or, you know, reducing waste. Um, and it's largely relied on volunteerism and grants and donations. And we're certainly not um, doubting the importance of volunteers in community, highly important, um, as is the need for government to support some of these community initiatives to have grant programs, um, programmatic funding. But what we're seeing is that communities are starting to take on different roles. They're setting up businesses and they're participating in a commercial market. Uh, and they're using the power of the economy to shift to more financially sustainable operations. So how can communities or how can you think about doing this? So today I'm going to share with you three approaches. 
Um, the first is redefining community good as a commercial good or service. Uh, the second is setting up or supporting business and enterprise models that support community. And the third, third is using commu uh, commercial local ownership models to increase the viability of sustainability efforts. Number one, um, redefining community good as a good or service. So um, we all know that community undertakes many valuable uh, activities in a place. They're regenerating bushland, they're educating people about um, recycling, they're running the local repair cafe, uh, promoting electrification of households, all sorts of amazing sustainability um, valuable activities. But some communities um, are valuing these uh, beyond what I would call the community good. They're actually starting to redefine the value of what they do. So that means they're actually starting to see their contribution as an economic one with a financial value. Uh, and they're really owning the importance of community being economically rewarded for their work. So for some of us working on community initiatives, this feels quite uncomfortable, um, but it's important. It helps for the longevity of the work. Um, so they're also leveraging markets and they're leveraging demand. So by, by this, they're, they're seeing the skills and the products uh, that their initiative offers and they're seeking and they're responding to existing markets and existing demand and emerging markets and emerging demand. And then they're packaging these initiatives as a good or a service and they're receiving a financial benefit. At the same time, we're also seeing communities stepping into the role of an essential service provider. So in energy, for example, um, as Megan shared with that story, uh, we used to rely on big corporations to provide our energy. Um, but communities can now provide this essential service. And I guess you could say this, there's a similar story for waste processing as well. So we have communities seeing the economic um, and financial value of what they're doing. They're aware of and they're leveraging markets. They're packaging the initiatives up as a good or service. And they're also stepping into the role of um, essential service provider. So let me share my first example. Um, and I love a good case study. So this, um, this is the Groundswell Collective. It's based locally near me um, in Lake Macquarie. It's set up as a not-for-profit, but it's anything but. The entire um, premise of what they're doing is to make a profit, and the reason they're trying to that, do that is to have a greater impact. So the project lead, Anna, was really interested in tiny forests and she really wanted to test this concept in Lake Macquarie. Um, she managed to receive a small grant and that grant really just paid for the trees. Um, she had volunteer earth um, works from a local company. She used yeah council land, which um, was quite logistically difficult. And it relied completely on volunteers, including her volunteer hours in terms of project coordination. So she spent hours and hours uh, coordinating this project. And it took years. The first one took years to get in the ground. Um, so based on that, you know, she, she realised that she could really only have, you know, one tiny forest every couple of years being installed based on that timeline. Like it just wasn't going to amplify the work that she wanted to do. She's very passionate um, about climate, about biodiversity loss. She wanted to have a bigger impact than that. So um, she started to think about how she could commercialise and amplify what she was doing. Um, she founded the Groundswell mid last year. And um, since then, she's partnered with Carbon uh, Positive Australia. She started utilising uh, private land, so schools, ag colleges, um, individually owned land. So there's a much quicker turnaround in terms of um, the logistics of, of the land that she's using. Um, the project management is now funded. So the people working within Groundswell are actually now getting paid for some of the work that they're doing. 
And they're also able to pay a local um, contractor for the earthworks, so they're not relying on the donations and the, um, you know, unreliability, I guess, of that. So since last year, she's planted another two tiny forests. There's five planned for the rest of the year. She's moving into private works on, on private property. People are asking to um, get quotes for tiny forests on their land. And she's establishing these great relationships with some local corporates as well who are interested in exploring um, their corporate social responsibility and how a tiny forest might meet some of their needs. So operating in a very commercial way, and that's helping to amplify and attract interest. Um, a very quick side story is that I was talking to Anna a couple of weeks ago and she was asked to speak at a sustainability conference, a local sustainability conference, for which she wasn't offered a speaker's fee. Um, now, all the speakers coming from outside the region are, are being paid a speaker's fee. And so we had this really interesting conversation around um, her value and, and the kind of message it sends that, um, that local knowledge is not valued, but the external knowledge is. Um, so she actually went back and asked for a speaker's fee, which she did receive. Um, but I thought it was a great little example too of kind of owning her contribution um, and, you know, asking for that financial reward because of it. Um, approach number two. So community groups, community are setting up or they're working with businesses and enterprises that support community. Um, so, you know, the, the story um, that I shared of Anna's is an example. Um, communities are setting up businesses and enterprises to advance their sustainability transitions. Um, for Anna, there was a market. She could see there was an emerging market for, for what she was offering. There was interest and she suspected that she could amplify it um, by creating a fi financially sustainable enterprise. But of course, not all communities um, or individuals want to run a business or an enterprise. Um, everyone here is probably involved in many, many things already and wear, wears many different hats. Um, there are many businesses out there, many enterprises out there um, operating in the sustainability space. So they're interested and committed to many of the principles that Megan talked about in terms of local ownership, local control, reinvesting locally, regeneration. Um, those businesses and those enterprises exist. Um, and so there's some great examples of communities actually leveraging the work that businesses are doing already to fill local sustainability gaps and to help amplify local efforts. So now we're going to fly from Lake Macquarie to Norfolk Island with this example here. So um, this is a very cool example and Megan and I were really um, lucky to work with Revolve Your World, so we know it quite intimately. Um, so back in um, 2020, the Norfolk Island community gathered and they formed an initiative called the Norfolk Wave. So this was really a campaign that was funded by a Marines Park grant to try and raise awareness around waste choices on Norfolk Island. So um, for, for those who don't know, um, Norfolk Island used to burn their bulky waste and tip it into the sea. Um, they exported household and commercial waste back to landfill in Australia. And of course, that was a pretty costly exercise. So um, anyway, the Norfolk Wave ran this campaign. Um, you know, it had a really positive effect on environmental awareness and on personal responsibility in terms of waste choices. But it really became clear early on that the Norfolk community um, could only go so far with the current waste system. So as luck would have it, one of the founders of Norfolk Wave had heard about a company called Revolve Your World, and they'd been doing some work in Byron Bay with a hotel in Byron Bay. Uh, and they literally managed to, um, to shift their recycling rate at this hotel from 10% to 90% overnight. Um, so this person from the Norfolk Wave, this really sparked her interest. And she began to explore how Revolve Your World's circular waste approach could be applied to Norfolk Island. So fast forward today, um, 
Revolve Your World has been uh, has established a circular waste facility on Norfolk Island as of late last year. Uh, the process takes green waste and transports it in and transfer makes it into compost. <laughs> uh, it takes plastic um, into uh, concrete aggregate, glass into sand, and cardboard into carbon. Um, but what's really great about the business model of um, Revolve Your World is that they're highly committed to reinvesting in place and in, in community, and they're really focused on community-led projects. The local people all head up their engagement program, and they've been in, in, um, exploring some really innovative financial reinvestment models. So how can some of that economic benefit from the processing plant get reinvested back into place? Um, now, the cool thing is that, like, this true partnership is working, like, ridiculously well. After three months, they have managed to um, increase landfill diversion rates from 35% to 75%. So um, the Norfolk community know they couldn't have, have achieved this shift alone. So it's a really powerful um, partnership. Um, I just wanted to show really quickly, just because I'm a bit of a waste geek and I thought this was very cool. Um, on the next slide, there's just a screenshot of the community dashboard that Norfolk Wave has established with Revolve Your World. So this time it shows real real time waste statistics for the island. Um, and I just thought it was another really great example of a place based business um, aligning with a community group to to achieve better outcomes. Um, so you can actually jump on that, and if you're interested in waste, you can. It's quite fun to watch. <laughs> Um, approach number three, the use of um, commercial, locally um, owned business models. So this is the last approach I wanted to share for today. Um, there are certain commercial ownership models that enable more ownership and control to be in the hands of local people. They exist. And they also can accommodate commercial operations. So um, think structures like cooperatives, um, companies with local community shareholders, employee ownership. So when we preference these ownership structures, the community has greater control of the initiative or the enterprise and they retain some or they retain all of that wealth locally. Um, of course, then local people can decide how a product or a service is delivered. So um, maybe that's producing a really quality product, maybe that's sourcing local imports, maybe they're using, using marginalised um, employees. And they can also decide how profits are distributed. So, for example, uh, it might be local shareholders that are receiving those profits um, and so that money stays locally. It could be that the entity decides to offer lower prices or maybe they use some of the profit to invest in other local initiatives. So um, this control really can help to advance sustainability transitions. Um, so my last case study um, for this section that I wanted to share, and many of you may know of this case study because it's Victorian and it's an awesome case study, um, but it's the Yakandanda Community Development Company. Um, okay, there's nothing sustainable about a petrol station. I'll put that out there to begin with. But um, it's my favourite case study to talk about community ownership structures because it really shows how an enterprise can evolve with a community and how they've really cleverly set up um, the entity structure to have this um, really great flow and effect in the community. So... Um, Back in 2002, the Yakandana community found out that their petrol station was about to close um, and the, the locals really wanted to save this asset. To them, it was like a real essential service in the community and there'd be real flow and effects um, in the town if they lost it. So a group of locals created a, a public company to try and buy the asset and they offered local people shares. So... The petrol station, the, the structure itself wasn't salvageable, uh, but they did manage to gather 630 shareholders 
who all invested enough to rebuild a petrol station in the town. Um, now, the cool thing is the shareholders now receive a commercial dividend each year. So they're actually receiving, you know, a return on what they invested. Share prices are up. Um, and 50% of the profit um, is spent on local initiatives. So think, you know, CFA, sports club, um, but also sustainability initiatives. So, you know, they funded the EV charging station strategy for Yak and Danda. So the fact that the community is at the helm has really allowed the company to direct their profits, um, but also to take on other business streams, um, maybe not super commercial business streams, but that are important to the community. So they've also taken on the local newspaper, for example. Um, if you were to contrast that to a traditional petrol station, most likely owned by a large corporate, most likely overseas, um, control of operations, wealth, all leaves local people. Uh, there's no consideration of local priorities, um, no reinvestment and, you know, no positive impact on the community apart from being able to get your petrol. So the next economic uh, intervention area that we're going to look at is around assets and resources and how they can really amplify local sustainability transitions. So um, by assets, we mean basically any property that has any kind of value. Um, and that's or that it is expected to generate value over time. So we know that assets are valuable. Um, we can use them to provide economic benefit. We can use them to meet economic demand for things over time. It, they can generate revenue, they can generate income, and they can create capital growth and wealth. Um, so of course, it's a similar story, isn't it? Increasingly, assets and resources are being owned and controlled by large corporations, again, even those that used to be owned by government. Um, but it is not beyond community to be able to also own assets and control these assets and use these assets and share in the wealth of these assets. So there's only uh, there's three approaches that I'm going to talk about in terms of assets. Um, the first is... Uh, Again, that idea of re redefining value. So redefining the value of local assets. Um, the second is identifying those assets in the community or within your organisation um, that could be utilised to amplify what you're doing. And the third is around um, community ownership of assets. So uh, number one, redefining value. Um, you probably see a theme with some of the things we've been talking about, but um, as I mentioned, as Megan mentioned, uh, emerging markets and shifting industries are providing communities with the opportunity to, to, to redefine what um, assets have value. Um, and from this, they can create local wealth, uh, they can amplify their sustainability initi um, initiatives, uh, some of the examples that we've already discussed today are a great um, show of that. Uh, the example that I'll show in a little bit also talks to the idea of redefining value. Uh, the second approach is around identifying assets in the community and within your organisation um, that can be utilised. So, um, I can imagine there's hundreds of fabulous uh, stories around community initiatives in the room and often they involve the innovative use of, of assets in the community. So those assets could be land, they could be buildings, equipment, space, waste, uh, even household uh, rooftops. So as someone who's wanting to scale sustainability transitions in your community, uh, you might want to consider what assets are underutilised or what might and what assets might help to amplify the work you're doing uh, or what assets could play other roles. So the example I'm going to share today is, is, a, is a social enterprise um, that's doing that really well. Uh, organic Feedback Recovery. So it's based in uh, Newcastle and started up in 2013. Um, 
it's a mouthful, but I like what they call their product, which is community supported food waste into food grown produce. Um, and there's two elements to what they're doing. So first of all, they have a program called Food Cycle uh, that collects food waste weekly from different hubs around Newcastle and Hunter. And then they go and turn that into compost to use on urban farms. Uh, so obviously taking something that has currently no economic value, food waste, uh, turning it into compost, which does. The second element is that they run urban food farms on free leases of private suburban land. So that can literally be someone's unused um, large backyard. Uh, they take that, that compost, they use that to improve the soil and Together, they produce, um, you know, a commercial product, which is food waste to food grown produce. So um, that's feedback recovery. Uh, the third approach that I want to touch on briefly is around, again, community ownership of assets. So I think you're all probably getting the point around the impact that having community-owned assets can have in terms of, um, being able to decide how land is used, how the business is run. Um, but I think an interesting thing to consider is that community can also um, hold a stake in infrastructure. So we all probably know of examples of uh, land, solar, petrol stations, businesses. Uh, but a great example, I think, which stretches us in Australia is ownership of infrastructure. Uh, so, communities starting to own solar infrastructure. Um, there's quite a few solar community solar projects around that we could point to. Um, overseas, it's really common for local people to have an ownership stake in large renewable infrastructure projects. So we're talking like large um, wind developments, large solar developments. Uh, in Denmark, for example, it's actually legislated. All new renewable energy products must offer at least 20% ownership um, of the overall venture to local residents. So one of my um, favourite examples of that um, is actually in Scotland, where we're seeing a similar thing in terms of community ownership of large, um, large renewable infrastructure. Um, this little town is a town of like 300 people called Fintry, Scotland. And in 2002, they were advised of a 12 turbine wind farm that was about to go in um, near their community. Uh, rather than object though, they actually went back to the developer and they asked for a stake. So they asked them um, to install a 13th turbine and for that to be owned by the community of Fintry. And so this wasn't a, um, a donation. They came up with a, a debt financing arrangement where um, effectively the developer lent the community the money for the 13th wind turbine. And over that um, first 15 years, so 25 year life of this wind turbine, the first 15 years the community um, paid back the loan and also earned about £900,000. And then after that payback period for the next 10 years, um, which is what they're in at the moment, they're currently earning half a million pounds a year from, from this um, community wind turbine. So all these funds have gone into a community uh, trust, a community organisation. Um, they've managed to offer all residents free uh, roof and wall ins insulation. Um, that obviously saved local people thousands of dollars. And uh, they've installed solar panels on the local school. They've investigated energy efficient transport. They've established an orchard. Um, massive flow on effects to, to the, the clever folk who, who managed to negotiate that deal with the, the wind farm operator. Uh, so that's a super brief look at, at assets. And obviously, just to add here that like a lot of the content we're covering today, we could we could run an entire workshop on any one of these topics. Um, so sorry to those who really want to deep dive, but um, hopefully this gives you a taste to it. Part two, finance. Um, 
So we're going to talk about how finance, uh, how you can leverage local finance and how finance can flow differently to enhance your sustainability transition. Um, historically, you know, practices concentrate wealth, they limit ownership, they exploit local assets. That really hinders communities' um, ability uh, to have their own agency, um, to invest, to innovate. Uh, but if we can try and come up with ways to source finance locally and change how finance is invested and owned and controlled and distributed, um, then we really can create better social, economic and environmental outcomes for a place. And I guess this topic's really dear to Ethical Field's heart because this is where we're investing a lot of our time at the moment around um, localising financial flows. Um, so when I'm talking about local finance, I'm actually really just referring to um, lending, investing, borrowing and financial resource pooling within a local community. So um, external financial flows that are aligned to a community's priorities and values are really important and really significant. But just because of, um, because of the short session, uh, we're just going to concentrate on local finance opportunities. Um, so local finance can offer incentives uh, to invest that attract local investment. So, for example, uh, a local person might be more vested in, interest, in investing in something locally. Um, they might also be willing to trade some financial return for other returns that they can receive from that investment. Um, Local finance often can unlock local capital that we that we overlook. So, you know, local people may not have a lot of um, financial means, but even a small amount over a, a population adds up to a pool that could have impact. And flowing from that, local capital, um, you know, we can pool it. We can make funding goals achievable by pooling it together. So there are many, many innovative community financing options. Um, you know, we've been looking at this for 12 months. So we're only going to share three today <laughs> due to time, but there are many, many different options. Um, so the first of those approaches is around community shares. Uh, the second is around community debt financing. Uh, the third is revolving funds. and even though it's not local capital, I'm also going to touch on commercial borrowing uh, opportunities. So uh, community shares. Uh, one way communities are raising funds and capital locally is via the issue of community shares. So uh, we saw that in the example of um, Yak and Dandel. Um, a community effectively creates an entity that could be a profit or a non-profit um, organisation and they issue shares or they offer memberships. Uh, community members invest, they become the shareholders and the members. And then the shareholders or the members receive a financial return, so that could be, you know, a, a dividend, or, and, or, um, they can receive a non-financial return. So, you know, there's examples of communities wanting to save, like the local general store, and not actually wanting to receive a financial return, but just wanting that general store to still exist. That to them is the return. It could be lower prices. It could be a local discount. It could just be an intrinsic value of knowing you're helping community or environment. Um, most community, most community ownership um, examples have both. Or yeah. So um, the example I'm going to share with you is uh, the Food Connect Shed. So uh, Food Connect is a, um, or was, a community-supported uh, agricultural enterprise, and they operated out of a shed, shed that they rented in Brisbane. One day they were advised that the shed was going to be sold. Uh, so faced with the having to relocate, they decided to, to buy the shed. Um, now, this shed, actually, they probably could have gone to a traditional lender. It would have ha it has an income, it has tenants. A traditional lender quite possibly would have lent them the money in this instance. But they decided to offer community members the opp opportunity to invest in the shed and hold an ownership stake. Um, they managed to raise $2 million. A lot of that was from suppliers and customers, and they purchased the shed. 
Uh, so the community investors now receive a dividend. Um, they collect rents from the tenants, uh, but they also enjoy the utility of the incubator space that they've cultivated. They run events. Um, like it's a really important community hub. It plays a role beyond just a, a shed that's rented out to tenants. All of those startups share similar values and um, they've got a place to base themselves now. Uh, so like I said, there's also examples of um, memberships or, you know, non-profit non type arrangements um, where members have invested because of, of those other non-financial benefits that they want to receive. Uh, so another source of local funding is debt financing. So basically uh, local people lending other local people or local people lending local organisations or initiatives money to buy an asset or to start an initiative. So um, locals who lend money might receive a commercial return. Um, they might be willing to receive a slightly lower rate um, because of those non-financial benefits that we're talking about. There are lots of simple and other more complex ways of seeking debt financing. Um, I'm going to just point to a simple example today, which is peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, so peer-to-peer -peer lending basically matches people with money uh, who want to invest uh, with people who are looking for a loan. So there are some really great examples of this in the US um, where monies are being borrowed and used for all different types of businesses, enterprises and initiatives. So this one here is the Lion Network in Washington and uh, the network connects local investors uh, with local businesses and initiatives seeking financial capital. They've got 72 members and they've invested 10.5 million in local businesses. Um, the lenders and the business set the terms, so the interest rate could be anything from nothing to a commercial rate of return as long as both parties agree. Um, and as well as creating, um, you know, uh, investment capital for these businesses, they're creating this really strong local investment landscape. They're building social capital, um, they're building businesses, they're fostering relationships and they're connecting communities. So, it goes far beyond just the financial exchange of money. Um, approach number three is revolving funds. Um, Victoria has some stellar examples of this. So uh, a revolving fund is just basically a way of creating a pool of financial capital that is loaned out to an initiative. And then when that capital is repaid, it gets lent out again. So think of it, the, the capital, the lending, getting loaned out and getting returned again. Um, the initial funds could come from all sorts of sources, donations, grants, um, a local profit-making enterprise that's connected with the, the fund. And really, yeah, the power of the model is that magnif magnification of that capital, the fact that it gets recycled. Uh, I reckon a lot of you probably know of this example, but I'm going to share it because it's a cracker. Um, so this is the Wonthaggy Coal Mine Initiative. So um, Energy Innovation Cooperative championed a solar and battery array installation uh, at State Coal Mine in Wonthaggy. Uh, the initiative was co-funded with community, so community threw in some money, council and state government. And uh, an energy uh, innovation cooperative sells the generated electricity from that um, solar to Parks Victoria. Now, the income they receive from Parks Victoria goes into this revolving fund called Southern Core Fund, and that fund is used to um, fund other community projects. So community groups can apply for an interest-free loan uh, to fund their own solar panels or... Um, energy efficiency measures for their organisation. And when they um, they repay the interest-free loan based on the savings that they make from having those installed, once the uh, repayment's made, the funds get lent out again. So they get revolved, revolved and recycled around. Um, as an example, 
the Foster Pool Association received a three-year loan, interest-free, of $20,000 to um, install solar thermal heating for the pools. And that's now been repaid and out the money will go again to another community organisation. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, I'm just going to very briefly touch on commercial lending and the opportunities that are starting to open up for commercial lending. So, banks are also facing the need to support the net zero transition and to meet their own um, corporate social responsibility requirements. So we're starting to see a range of financing options that actually support rooftop solar, batteries, EV transitions. Um, the Commonwealth Bank has a green loan um, that offers like a 1.9% loan up to 30000 on installing uh, energy efficiency solar um, in homes. We're also starting to see discounted finance for land managers. Uh, to fund changes that in, that enhance environmental outcomes. So again, these help individuals and enterprises, land managers um, to access discounted funding and financing to accelerate their sustainability transitions. So that is just a very brief um, dipping our toe into the water in terms of community financing. Uh, I hope you're all starting to see some inspiration and ideas opening up for you around these things. Uh, 